Hello, I'm Suzanne Prue, the chair of the Edinburgh University Art Department. As many of you know, Edinburgh Art Department is celebrating our 100th year. Founded as an art education program, the heart of Edinburgh's success is the act of teaching, and our professors share their skills in animation, art education, art history, ceramics, design, drawing, film, furniture design, gallery management, graphic design, interactive media, jewelry design, metalworking, painting, photography, printmaking, sculpture, socially engaged art, and woodworking. What a list. Despite uh, all this shared talent, we faculty know that students need a lot of, need to see a lot of art firsthand. Thus, our faculty have taken students on trips across the state, around the country, and all over the world. In addition, the Bruce Gallery and the Visiting Artist Speaker Endowment, or VASE, committee was created to bring in national level artists to show their work and meet with students. Tonight's event featuring Aruna D'Souza is part of a 22 year old partnership between Edinburgh University's VASE and the Erie Art Museum. Each year, Edinburgh faculty identify nationally renowned potential art world professionals to jury the museum's annual spring show, deliver a public talk, and meet with students. We are grateful to be part of this successful collaboration, and I'd like to invite the museum's interim director, Pam Massey, to introduce herself to you all. After Pam has completed her short remarks, Edinburgh's Dr. Charlotte H. Wellman will take over and host the rest of tonight's program. Thanks, Suzanne. I'm so pleased to represent the Erie Art Museum and welcoming Aruna back to the Erie community and very grateful for our partnership with Edinburgh University. Aruna's work as a juror for our 97th annual spring show has been applauded by our artists and our community members. The show is thought provoking in so many ways, especially in light of this um, pandemic, when people needed to be aroused in empathy, imagination, daringness, and much more, when our community needed it most. Her humble words speak such appreciation for the artists and what influences them to create. She encourages artists to use creating art as a survival skill. She's curated a show that touches everyone in a way that speaks to their individual reality and desires. Thank you, Aruna, curator, artist, and inspiration for sharing your talent with all of us. And I know that all of us look forward to your insights this evening. Thank you. I wanna begin by letting everybody know that our meeting is being recorded. We would like to thank Jill Linton, our IT colleague, and Chris LaFuria and Communications for their help and support in promoting this panel. My name is Charlotte Wellman. I'm an Associate Professor of Art History at Edinburgh University. I also serve on the Visiting Artists and Speakers Committee, a host of Aruna D'Souza's virtual visit. I'll begin by introducing our speaker. I will introduce panelists joining the conversation at the close of Aruna's talk. Aruna D'Souza served as the 2020 juror of the Erie Art Museum Spring Show. D'Souza writes about modern and contemporary art, intersectional feminisms and other form of politics, and how museums shape our views of each other and the world. Her whitewalling, art, race, and protest in the three acts published by Badlands was named one of the best art books of 2018 by the New York Times. D'Souza's talk tonight is entitled Against Empathy, the Value of Mistranslation in Art and Life. Aruna, welcome. Hello, thank you so much for that um, gracious introduction. And thank you very much for inviting me into the Edinburgh community, into the Erie Art Museum community. Um, all of this was supposed to take place 
uh, last spring and got um, uh, sort of shuffled around uh, as we all tried to figure out, um, you know, how to respond to uh, the pandemic and the needs of social distancing. And, um, you know, I remember the day very vividly that I sat down to do the um, jurying of uh, the submissions for the Erie Art Museum show. And I told my some friends after that it was the most um, reviving thing I could possibly have done because it, in a period of uncertainty, a period of, of um, I think it's fair to say panic, at least for me, <laughs> that um, seeing um, and engaging with uh, creativity that was coming often from pe some people um, were professional full-time professional artists. Many people were making art um, over and above all of the other things they had to do to keep, uh, you know, making a living and keep sustaining themselves. And seeing that energy was um, such a wonderful and uh, really, for me, very inspiring um, thing to do. So I really, it was, it was, um, it was fun, and it was uh, a new experience for me. And I always love those, but the timing of it couldn't have been better. It really, um, uh, it really got me through. I think uh, a hard time. So I very much appreciate that, and I'm very much looking forward to tonight's conversation as well as upcoming conversations with um, members of your Edinburgh University community. So with that, I think I'll um, switch to my um, images so everyone can see them and start with my talk. Okay. So what you're seeing on the screen is a image by Parker Bright. It's actually a um, gouache uh, and pencil drawing uh, by Parker Bright uh, called Confronting My Own Possible Death from 2018. Parker Bright was one of the artists who um, protested the presence of Dana Schutz's painting of Emmett Till at the 2017 Whitney Biennial. Um, and uh, his protest involved a performance in the galleries uh, where he stood with a t-shirt that said Black Death Spectacle between viewers and the painting and spoke to viewers in the galleries about the implications of showing um, an image of a, of a dead Black boy, uh, a murdered Black boy uh, in um, the Whitney's landmark, you know, biannual exhibition. At the heart of the discussions of Dana Schutz's choice to paint Emmett Till was the question of empathy. Her defenders considered her attempt to grapple with this particular death as not just appropriate, but necessary. In her sorrow and rage, Mamie Till Mobley, Emmett Till's mother, wanted her son's death not just to be her pain, but America's pain, Dana Schutz wrote, echoing the feelings of so many people, white people for the most part, who were trying to understand in the wake of a long overdue attention to the history of racial injustice in the US, how to heal long festering wounds. Art was a way to enact such healing, said Schutz. Art can be a space for empathy, a vehicle for connection, she wrote. I don't believe that people can ever really know what it is like to be someone else. I will never know the fear that black parents may have, but neither are we all completely unknowable. In the aftermath of the 2016 presidential election, oops, there we go. Liberal pundits realized with horror how many people were willing to vote for an outspoken white supremacist and doubled down on the idea that empathy was the key to a more progressive political arena. Love Trump's hate became the rallying cry post-election as it had been during Hillary Clinton's campaign, a slogan that placed the personal obligation to understand each other at the heart of a politics of resistance. In this context, Schutz's desire to see Emmett Till's death 
as part of an unhyphenated American history was very much part of the work that many white Americans decided they must start to do in order to grapple with the continuing and enduring racism of their country. Even before the controversy erupted, the curatorial framing of the biennial reflected such attitudes. As Mia Locke said in the exhibitions catalog, one of the motivations of the show was to bring into visibility new forms of solidarity that were forming across lines of race and other oppressions. In other words, questions of how to be allies. In this context, it was all but inevitable that Schutz's painting became a flashpoint. While many on the left faced the results of November's election with an anguished reckoning, there were others, especially Black women, who were, not to put too fine a point on it, fed up, once again disappointed at the ways in which white liberal politics, especially white liberal feminism, had failed them. The feeling came from the terrifying fact that 53% of white women had voted for Trump, it came from seeing that for all the soul searching being done by many of the other 47% about the role racism played in his victory, very few were willing to examine their own investments in whiteness and white supremacy. It came from watching white women, and far less often white men, publicly speaking the language of intersectional feminism in Facebook posts, but lashing out at anyone asking them what they were doing to improve the lives of Black women in any tangible way. It came from endless occasions of being scolded by white progressives that now, in the face of Trump's threat, it was important to put aside their quote-unquote identity politics in favor of uniting behind a common cause, one that was often overlooked one that often overlooked the radically different effects that such a threat might have when it comes to class, race, and so on. It came from hearing how if we would just only pay attention to the overlooked needs of the white working class, instead of the needs of the 96% of black women who voted for Trump, an almost identical list of needs, it should be noted, we wouldn't be in this mess. It came from the fact that so many, so many of the people who were supposed to be allies had failed to step up or had imagined that simply being sad and empathetic, or at least performing their empathy, was enough. Indeed, for those who spoke up against Schutz's painting, the question was not whether she, as a white person, was free to engage the subject matter at all, but whether she had done so ethically and responsibly. In other words, the question was not that Schutz should not have engaged with a particular history in her art. Rather, it was that in her position as a non-Black person, her aesthetic choices failed to rise to the level of historical and political understanding needed to meet the work's own social and artistic ambitions. She may have wanted to stand in solidarity. Instead, she acted as a bad ally. Perhaps Schutz made the same mistake that all those people chanting love Trump's hate were making assuming that personal performances of empathy were enough to bridge the kind of gap she wanted to address. I don't know what it is like to be Black in America, but I do know what it is like to be a mother, she had said. Where Schutz's supporters heard in her words a brave attempt at empathy, her detractors heard her centering herself and her feelings, her white tears, as some would derisively describe it, at the expense of Black viewers for whom Emmett Till was anything but historical. In the words of Aria Dean, one of the signatories of the open letter that circulated condemning Dana Schutz's painting in the Whitney Biennial, um, Aria Dean wrote in a Facebook post of March 21st that was later published in the New Inquiry, I am not a mother myself, so I may be speaking out of turn, but it is my understanding and my sense based on the experiences of my mother and my grandmothers and all of the Black women who have mothered children or helped to nurture any Black child at any stage of life, and my feelings as someone with even the vaguest potentiality of Black motherhood, and furthermore, Black parents in general, fuck the invocation of motherhood to some degree, Black fatherhood is plagued with these same worries that the degree to which the 
murder of your child is incomprehensible to a white mother exists on a plane very different from the way that possibility exists in the mind of a black mother. For the black mother, the possibility of violence and death for her black child is a reality, not a conceptual impossibility that might be that might by horrific unimaginable accident find its way to her doorstep. The question of Schutz's empathy came up again about um, a year and a half ago when her first gallery show since the biennial controversy opened at Friedrich Petzl Gallery. A spate of articles in the art press in advance of the show breathlessly wondered how the painter, battered and bruised by the fury of protesters, would manage to hold her head high once again. It did not go unnoticed how many of the writers of those articles were white men. The impression was that of a phalanx of white knights coming to the rescue of a damsel in distress an impression reinforced by Schutz's own insistence that her intentions had been honorable, that she didn't blame the protesters for their anger, and that she had learned her lesson. But a passage in a New York Times interview struck me as odd. Sorry, that's, um, here's the passage. The long-term effects of the controversy, she said, is that she, she has internalized the viewpoints of the protesters even when making the work. Sorry, I have to minimize all your faces. Um, I've had so many conversations with people who were upset by the painting, Ms. Schutz said, adding that she has included them in my imagined audience when I'm painting. It's good those voices were heard. Either way, emotion and empathy the seem to drive her work. I'm interested in how something feels rather than how it looks, she said at her studio, explaining her approach. So I saw this in the New York Times and I was so puzzled that here was an artist whose work has apparently always hinged on the notion of empathy, but it was only in the aftermath of the um, Whitney Biennial protests that she began um, including the voices of a black audience in her thinking process, which to me seems like a very basic uh, element of empathy. So it began, at, you know, I began thinking about, and I think I'm, I'm fascinated by this question of what empathy can mean if it doesn't uh, start with, um, thinking about who is experiencing one's artwork or who is listening to one's words or who is, um, or who is um, sort of subject to one's utterances. Uh, so, um, so I wanted to talk now about this question of empathy because I'm a, a fan of it in human interactions, but I'm not a fan of it in the political realm, and I'm going to ex try and explain why. There is a scene in Amitav Ghosh's Sea of Poppies where Sarang Ali, a, a Rohingya seaman en route from the Americas to China on the Ibis, which is a ship, is called in to translate for the ship's second mate, Zachary Reed who is a freed black man from Baltimore passing as white to his English superiors. He is questioning, Zachary Reed is questioning Jodu, a Bengali boy who has recently been taken on as a lowly crew member, about Paulette, the daughter of a French botanist who settled in Calcutta some years before. Jodu's mother was Paulette's wet nurse and the two grew up, the narrator tells us, head to head at her breast. Zachary recently met Paulette and had fallen in love, which is apparent to everyone but Zachary himself. Sarang Ali, recognize, recognizing Zachary's true heritage as a black man and seeing his future success as a subversive form of revenge on the racist British shipping magnates who employ all of them, is determined not to allow his boss to sacrifice said future for the vagaries of the heart. Sarang Ali translates Jodu's story 
a heart-wrenching tale of the dramatic death of Paulette's mother in his family's boat as they attempted to ferry her across the river to get medical help. His own mother's devotion to Paulette, the unusually intimate relationship between Jodu's mother and Paulette's father, Paulette's unconventional upbringing outside of the strict morals and manners of the British Raj, Paulette's father's generous and profligate nature, his death, and Paulette's subsequent destitution and her eventual adoption by Mr. Burnham, the owner of the ship on whose decks they now stand. And so all of that information, Sarang Ali set, manages to fit into what you're seeing right now on the screen. So I will try and read it, but forgive um, my pronunciation of these words that are um, a little bit unfamiliar to me. Launder say father blongi she go hebin. That bugger do too muchy tree pigeon. All o time picking plant. Inside pocket have no cash. After he go hebin, chow chilo catchy number two father, Mr. Bur Burnham. Now she too muchy happy inside. Eat big, big rice. Better malum zikri forget she. How can learn sailor pigeon all the time thinking ladies, ladies. More better keep busy with laundry till marriage time. Perhaps you do not quite understand what Sarang Ali is saying in this passage, not to worry. As it turns out, Zachary doesn't either. In a sense, that's the point of Gosha's book, which is full of moments of inadequate or outright mistranslation. Gauche, in addition to being a novelist, is an anthropologist and a student of linguistics, and he puts his knowledge to compelling use in this, the first book of his Ibis trilogy. Sea of Poppies revels in the beauty and contradiction of languages' particularities and their hybridity, in their geographic locatedness and their propensity to travel and morph, and in their speakers' and readers' aspirations to be understood and our inevitable failure to be comprehended. And through all this translation and mistranslation, the story proceeds anyway. The novel is set in the early years of the 19th century, 1838 to be precise, in a port city, not just a port city in fact, but in some ways the port city, Calcutta, one of the major hubs of the capitalist enterprise known as the British Empire. Port cities are, by nature, sites of intersection, of bodies, trade routes, economies, cultures, and above all, of languages. The characters we encounter are all connected in some way to a ship, the Ibis, on a journey spanning the globe. It has recently completed a long haul from the Americas where it transported enslaved laborers, slavery was still legal in the US, and gathered cotton in return, to England where it swapped out that cotton for other commodities, and around the coast of the African continent where it picked up more goods and quote unquote indentured labor, a category akin but not identical to chattel slavery, which allowed the business of empire to continue despite Britain's technical outlawing of the slave trade itself. To Mauritius, where it dropped off said indentured labor to work on plantations. To Calcutta, where its owner is based. So it goes all the way from um, the Americas uh, and we end up in, in Calcutta. Um, the hope that is that the boat will eventually go on to China carrying opium, the main currency of Britain's, Britain's colonial adventures, a trade that was at that moment under threat by the Chinese who recognized it as a form of colonial violence, but not before making another run to Mauritius to, to deliver Indian indentured laborers sold into servitude to pay off the debts accrued through the harsh economic exploitation of their British overlords. The Lascars on the Ibis, a motley crew of sailors who hopped on at various points in this journey, all hail from all parts of the globe. As Zachary slowly realizes as he acculturates to life on board, quote, they came from places that were far apart that had nothing in common except the Indian Ocean. They learned to communicate with each other in Lascari, 
a hybrid language produced out of a funky stew, a quote, motley tongue spoken nowhere but on the water, whose words were as varied as the port's traffic, an anarchic medley of Portuguese Kalaluzes and Kerala Patamars, Arab booms and Bengal ponchways, Malay proas and Tamil catamarans, Hindustani pulwars and English snows. Yet beneath the surface of this farrago of sound, meaning flowed as freely as the currents beneath the crowded press of boats. It is a language, in other words, not tied to land or country, but to movement, migration, trade routes, and the space between. And it was the language that I had up on the screen a few minutes ago. Other characters in the book share this experience of linguistic flow and occasional stoppage for different reasons. These include a French woman who is more comfortable in Hindi than English and who is isolated both because her mother tongue is so rarely spoken in this place and because she is seldom allowed to converse in Hindi due to social expectations of mem sahibs. Even those characters unambiguously located in a linguistic milieu experience a sense of dislocation. As they interact with an increasingly diverse population as they travel closer and closer to the city of Calcutta, South Asian, but in this case Bengali, peasants go unheard both because of their varied rustic dialects and because of their caste or class status. But it is significant that the English men and women in the narrative are as difficult to understand as anyone else. This book does not make a joke of people's inability to speak so-called proper English. Rather, it sets its sights on the narrative possibilities and comic effects of the incomprehensibility and even impossibility of a so-called common tongue or of finding any linguistic middle ground. The British superiors, the ship's officers, the owners of the shipping companies, the colonial officials and businessmen, many of whom were born and bred in the colonies, may be indifferently educated, but they do not at all lack the, for the pretensions of their race on that account. They are no easier to understand than the Lascars or the locals. Their dialect is liberally sprinkled with a coarse and malformed Hindi, the result not just of mangled grammar, but also of the eccentricities of transliteration between incompatible alphabets. As a result, their form of English is full of vocabulary and idioms that the contemporary reader will find hard to parse. The irony, as Ghosh pointed out in an interview in 2008, is that most of the words that cause us to stumble appear in the Oxford English Dictionary as the record of a time in which English was much more open to Asian influence than it is now. In the face of all this linguistic and cultural confusion, Ghosh makes a very important decision, which is that he refuses to translate for the reader. We are thrown, just as the characters are, into a confusing melange of meaning and left to make our way through the narrative. And make our way we do. That is what strikes me as so remarkable about Sea of Poppies. The fact that despite, and sometimes even because of, this constant misunderstanding, the story progresses and characters fumble their way through the world. Time passes, history is made, unmade, and remade. The book asks us to imagine ourselves in a world with only the merest wisp of a common language an English that has been forced upon its speakers in myriad directions and has been infiltrated by many other tongues, thanks to colonialism and trade. It ends with an uprising, an explosive event that is impelled by incomplete understandings, but that opens a space for future entanglements, movements, actions, and encounters. Translation is a practice that strives for an impossibility, a chimera of perfect understanding across the chasm of language, ideology, and culture. One undertakes it knowing that it will always be a failed project, that some notions are simply untranslatable, that even if one finds the perfect words to express a foreign notion, that notion will not lose its foreignness enti entirely, 
but still we persist in our belief that translation is necessary for understanding, that understanding is a prerequisite for empathy, and that empathy is an antidote to cruelty. To make our world more fair and just, we must be able to fathom each other fully. Our ability to be kind is predicated on our ability to relate to those on whom we bestow that kindness. We imagine that a productive collectivity only emerges from a shared language, or at least from an, from an ability to translate near seamlessly between languages. The problem, of course, is that I don't want to have to wait until people understand me for them to see me as a fully, as fully human and vice versa. And I also don't want to believe that a sort of coming together, a consensus has to emerge before we carry on with the task of dismantling the aspects of our lived experiences that are untenable, violent and inhumane. But even more than that, I don't want to lose the beauty inherent in misunderstanding, in the incompatibility of two systems of sign making, in the glitches that occur when words and thoughts and ideas don't match up, when new ideas are formed out of the ashes of mistaken readings and stubborn, even perverse resistances to comprehension. The late, and deeply problematic scholar Harold Bloom, in his classic work of literary theory, The Anxiety of Influence, described the way younger poets opened a creative space for themselves through a process of misprision, a willful misreading of the poetry of their elders. In a sense, Bloom was recognizing the way that mistranslation, misreading, and misunderstanding are not just failed attempts to translate, read, or understand, but indeed can be generative and creative acts, acts that make new forms of enunciation and new languages possible. Communication through that thicket of mistranslation is an act of generosity. It is a declaration that I value your speech without it having to be on my terms. It is a recognition that I will never fully understand what you are saying because I do not share your experience, linguistic or otherwise. It is a willingness to grasp what I cannot know and live with what I can, or I, I'm sorry, it is a willingness to grasp what I can know and, a, and to live with what I cannot know. It is too bad, in fact, that those of us who speak a common language are lulled into thinking that we know each other. Too bad that we do not have a constant reminder of the vast distances be between us, no matter our linguistic proximity. Because justice, kindness, and fairness, to my mind, are based not on understanding each other, but on finding each other's humanity despite our incapacity to understand. This ethics, a call to the collective, is a notion that underpins the translator's silence a piece from 2012 by Rux Media Collective. This work stages the incomprehension rather than understanding by juxtaposing languages, in this case, English, Bengali, and Urdu Hindustani, in ways that visually and linguistically suggest translation as a form of palimpsest, not a conversion of one language to another, but an unreadable accumulation of signs. In an interview with Avishek Ganguly, we see how this plays out through the, gift, through the gift of a refusal to translate. So Avishek says, what if the ability to read the language of the originals, so here you're seeing the piece, it's printed on a kind of vellum um, that you can only, so you can only really see what it says when you put it up to a window, put it up to a light or a dark background. And um, it, it has three lines of poetry um, in each in different languages. Um, so Avishek says, what if the ability to read the language of the original as a way of knowing the enemy transforms into the occasion for inviting the companionship of the stranger? Jibesh, one of the um, members of Rux, says, I remember there was a certain degree of confusion about that when it was shown here, because it seemed that 
at most, only two of those three languages could be comprehensible to our audience. So people could read, say, um, Bengali in English, or people could read Urdu in English, but very few people could read all three languages at once. Shridha Sangupta, another member of Rux, said, when people ask us, how am I supposed to know what the other languages are saying? Our response is always, find someone who can read it for you. So the work involves the search for someone who can read a poem to you in a language you don't understand. That person is usually someone you don't know. Empathy is one of the things that makes us human and is a deeply important quality to cu cultivate. The problem with imagining it as a useful tool for political transformation, however, is twofold. First, because as the work of Ibrahim X. Kendi in Stamp from the Beginning and other scholars demonstrate, racism did not come before institutions, racism in the form of racist ideas, racist thinking, ideas that, um, that, uh, at, that attribute um, certain kinds of lack to uh, the, the bio, you know, this sort of imagined biological construct of race. Racism did not come before institutions. Institutions created the need for racism. Racist ideas about black Africans were concocted in order to justify slavery. Slavery was not the product, but the origin of racism. As institutions such as slavery continued to structurally place black skinned people in debased positions, racism has become naturalized, practically invisible. Now, hundreds of years into the project of white supremacy, we must not fall into the gap or the trap of imagining that changing attitudes, cultivating empathy for the oppressed, will undo structures. The structures need to be undone in order to clear the conceptual and imaginative space for empathy to flourish. The second problem with considering empathy as a political tool, I've mentioned, as I've mentioned this, I don't want to wait for people to develop empathy for me until I am treated as a full human being. I don't want the fullness of your humanity to depend on my capacity for understanding either. Empathy is a personal transformation, not a collective act necessarily. It replaces political revolution with atomized notions of doing right by others. And when it is the basis for collective action, it can do as much harm as good. The colonizing projects of the European empires and the Catholic Church in an earlier moment of globalization were motivated or at least justified by empathy after all, by wanting to save people from their own darkness. A politics based on empathy imagines justice as something to be bestowed by newly enlightened individuals to up on other lesser individuals and communities. If there is a politics in empathy, it is one that allows the person called on to be empathetic, to remain in a position of supremacy, doling out justice as a matter of kindness. The idea that empathy is an antidote to cruelty is predicated on being able to fathom each other fully, to translate another person's experience into a reflection of one's own, and to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Achieving this goal is often said to require us to hear people's stories. Such thinking underpins some of the most effective and some of the most effective and affective artworks that have been made in recent years about the global migrant crisis, to take one example. A crisis manufactured by the imposition of borders that has seen 68.5 million people forced from their homes, according to the UN. More than 25 million of those are classified as refugees. Many of the works that I think of when I think of artworks made around the refugee crisis are all based on first person narratives by those who have had to flee and who find themselves either perpetually searching for safe haven or immobilized by borders and warehoused in provisional camps that have become increasingly permanent. Take for example, Candice Brights who asked Julianne Moore and Alec Baldwin to act out monologues based on interviews with six individuals from the Global South who had fled to safety. 
Okay, so this is an amazing piece where she interviewed the six um, different people who had been forced into um, into to, forced to leave their homes for reasons of political gender um, uh, or other kinds of, of oppression. You see them in in uh, on the bottom of the screen. In the piece, the piece is set up in sort of two different spaces, two different rooms, and uh, they are in the back room. So you see six monitors with them telling their stories over several hours. Uh, in the front room, the first room you enter, you see a screen uh, on which the image switches back and forth between uh, Julianne Moore and Alex Baldwin, um, and they are delivering monologues that you discover, you eventually realize are actually not their own sort of confessions, not their own stories, but they're ventriloquizing in a sense, the stories of the refugees that you haven't encountered directly yet. Um, and uh, they do, it's a very simple setup against a green screen, no fancy um, makeup or you know, um, pyrotechnics or anything like that. And the actors don't even use uh, accents or anything like that. It's just, um, but the the mimicry is kind of amazing. And the idea I think for Candice was uh, to think about the ways in which our attention and even our empathy um, is really only evoked in the West through these sort of um, the the, you know, notions of celebrity or fame, um, that we are much more likely to sit through Julianne Moore and Alec Baldwin narrating these horrific experiences than we would to sit um, and actually listen to the refugees themselves. Bushra Khalili asks refugees to trace their circuitous routes across borders and seas, simultaneously creating an oral history and a map of desperation. Um, here, this piece, what you see on these screens are large maps, people telling the artist how they are, got from where they had to leave to where they were trying to go, and all of the kinds of um, horrors and, uh, you know, um, obstacles and uh, crises they met along the way. Um, and by drawing this, you get to see that, that there's no going from here to there. Um, there's uh, all of these roots are, are themselves um, mazes. Christoph Wodigko, um, whose monument, which was on view in Madison Square Park in New York last uh, fall, projects the images and voices of a number of people forced from their homes onto an extant statue of a Civil War hero, a completely forgotten monument in the middle of New York City, turning um, this forgotten, you know, famous man from the Civil War uh, into a monument to the experiences of contemporary refugees. What does it take to shine a light on the devastating human and environmental costs of hoarding wealth and resources by an infinitesimally small global elite, a privileging of ease over life, both human and non-human, closed and thickened borders, white supremacy and its attendant mechanisms, capitalism most of all, and so on, in order to evoke our empathy and thereby provoke our action, the answer we might imagine is to ask those most affected by this crisis to speak, to open up about what has led them from home to not home. To do, in other words, what they are compelled to do in front of immigration officers, whether in New York or Berlin or Athens or San Diego or countless other ports of entry, to tell their stories, stories that include brutal rapes, torture, beatings, painful family separations, daily humiliations, constant terrorizing fear, privation, losses of all sorts, in order to justify their right to cross borders and find safety. What does it mean if, in order to be empathetic, we ask people to tell their truths? What differentiates us then, an audience seeking to understand, from border police, ICE agents, lawyers, judges, and so on? 
There are ways to make work about the injustices that face our species that do not inadvertently, inadvertently reproduce the invasive systems of state verification that are meant to re-traumatize those who reach our borders. Many, rely, many of these rely on storytelling, but of a fictional, even fantastical kind. Halil Altindere's Space Refugee, Space Refugee, an ongoing project begun, begun in 2016, takes the only Syrian cosmonaut, Mohammed Ahmed Faris, takes his dream of starting a colony for refugees on Mars and turns it into a parafictional futurist proposition. Um, Faris said, uh, you know, no one uh, speaking of Syrian refugees who are being are flooding have been flooding into countries surrounding Syria and often um, very unwelcome by those surrounding countries. Um, he said, you know, if no one on earth wants us, maybe we can start a colony on Mars. And so the, the idea of this piece is to actually start that colony. Likewise, Andros Zins Brown and Karthik Pandian in their three year now ongoing uh, collaboration with Assyrian refugee Zechariah Al-Mutlaq have devoted themselves to develop work driven by Al-Mutlaq's narration of his biography without knowing which parts of the story are real and which parts are fictional. Um, the, the, the version on the right is from an opera that, um, uh, that uh, they created out of Zachariah's um, narration of his refugee experience, for example. Both of the, what both of these works hinge on, these last two works I showed you, is that freedom is also the ability to tell lies. It's the ability to claim fiction in the face of the state's demands that we reveal our truths. Freedom is the ability to speak a language that is not understood Freedom is the ability to refuse to explain ourselves. And if that is the case, then solidarity is rooted not in our capacity to cross divides and to understand each other, but in the recognition that we have the obligation to, to care for others, no matter what stories they might tell about themselves, no matter if they refuse to speak, no matter if we have any sense of ourselves reflected in them. I'll just um, stop the screen for a second as I end. In one of the most moving passages of Gosha's novel, he illuminates the capacity of languages born of and circulated through a system of global exchange, empire building and wealth extraction and migration to transport even the most freedom bound people across time and space, not just in their own minds, but as part of a collective project of world building. Neil Ratan Halder is a rich landowner and minor Raja who has been convicted of forgery in a sham trial and is being sent as punishment to work in the plantations of Mauritius, a journey that will cause him to lose caste, lose face, and most of all, lose his liberty. On the way there, he asks a fellow prisoner, a Chinese man named Afat, about his origins. Where is your home, Afat? Tell me about it. Is it in a village? Not village, Afat scratched his chin. My home, very big place, Guangzhou, English called Canton. Tell me, tell me everything. Ho, ho. Thus it happened that while the Ibis was still on the Hogli, Neil was being transported across the continent to Canton. And it was this other journey, more vivid than his own, that kept his sanity intact through the first part of the voyage. No one but Afa, no one he had ever known, could have provided him the escape he needed into a realm that was wholly unfamiliar, unlike his own. It was not because of Afat's fluency that Neil's vision of Canton became so vivid as to make it real. In fact, the opposite was true. For the genius of Afat's descriptions lay in their elisions, so that to listen to him was a venture of collaboration in which the things that were spoken of came gradually to tr be transformed into artifacts of a shared imagining. 
Afat's description takes several pages of the novel, morphing from a personal recollection into its own narrative, one that is dissociated from any particular storyteller. It becomes something quite distinct, a novel within a novel, one that sets the stage quite literally for the next installment in Gosha's trilogy. The collaborative project of understanding each other across the chasms of incomprehension then is not a barrier to narrative drive, to the unfolding of life's lives and events, but a necessary prerequisite. For what is fiction but a matter of friction, of troubling our journeys in ways that are both delightful and harrowing? And what, for that matter, is life or politics, but that same thicket of bewildering signs that we experience alone and together out of which we make our fragile and contingent worlds. So I've taken you on a little bit of a meandering journey, but I hope that we'll have um, things to talk about as we think about um, ways in which um, instead of focusing on empathy, focusing on um, the ability for each of us to remain, uh, the, the sovereignty that's involved in each of us remaining um, incomprehensible, unreadable, untranslatable, um, and, uh, you know, uh, needs to remain part of our understanding of a politics, um, a, a politics of solidarity, a politics of um, justice for everyone. So. With that, I will turn it back over to Charlotte. Thank you, Aruna. Um, I, I, I feel still enmeshed in the tangle of words. <laughs> you know, um, uh, you have mentioned the beauty of um, of that entanglement, uh, perhaps uh, developing a new aesthetic um, that isn't founded on um, balance and symmetry, but on something perhaps a little wonkier. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I also um, hover on your phrase, and I'd like to use this to introduce our panelists. Uh, you talk about listening as an act of collaboration. Yes. And so let me invite our three panelists to uh, come together in that experiment. Russell D Cheryl Rush Dix will be our first speaker, our first respondent. Um, Cheryl is committed to reversing erasure through acknowledging and celebrating cultural achievements. She's collaborated with scholars, artists, and organizations to commemorate the historic St. James AME Church, African-American seamen in the Battle of Lake Erie, and Erie's native son, Harry Thacker Burley. A Fulbright alumna, Dix is the founder of Pathlight Associates and co-founder of the STEM Equity Alliance. Our second respondent is Dr. Rhonda Matthews. Her career has spanned 30 years in student affairs, administrative work, and academia. The majority of her work experience has been teaching in university classrooms. As a political sociologist who specializes in popular culture, she's able to transcend the difficulty of some academic and cultural topics by using a mix of knowledge and humor. Her work also extends beyond the classroom into the realms of diversity training, political action and advocacy, taking teaching and learning outside of the classroom and into community spaces. And finally, Leslie C. Sotomayor is an artist, curator, and professor in art education in women's gender and sexuality studies at Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania. Gloria Anzaldúa's theory of cognoscimiento an autohistoria teoría, a feminist writing practice rooted in transformative experience is central to her teaching methodology. She's committed to creating curriculum for empowerment and transformation by curating educational spaces that decolonize white hegemonic academic canons. Cheryl. 
I'm thrilled to go first. I was sort of bursting at the end with uh, a number of connections I was making with uh, your major assertions about the uh, uh, weighing into the languages as presented as experience. And I was thinking of um, some work I'd heard or some lectures I'd heard from John McWhorter, mm -hmm. the linguist. Mm -hmm. um, and his, um, his challenge to us to accept uh, pidgin languages as language, mm -hmm. just, just go in uh, and to do that, to take up that challenge as a way of flattening the judgment curve. We're all into flattening curves these days, but as flattening the judgment hierarchies and stratifications um, it, at the intersection of the people that you know, with whom you're having experience. And seeing that really as a, an essential work and essential challenge to have authentic experience. Um, so I, I thank you for taking me back there. Um, I'm newly um, uh, interested in, uh, in wading in those waters and those waters of, of languages that, um, that, that you shared with us by experience, it being different, um, it being present, it being in the now, and it being uh, essential to the experience of the other. You know, I, th I think that the, the, the sort of idea of pidgin languages as a whole, right? They, you know, that historically they've been treated as um, not fully languages, as, as sort of mangled mm -hmm. or in, inadequate languages. But really they're languages that, that emerge out of the necessity of speaking across differences. Mm -hmm right, across linguistic differences, also across cultural differences, also very much across power differences, right? right. And, so, and, and so understanding them as such and understanding the ways in which, I mean, you know, I think, that, you know, the, you know, what's funny is Sea of Poppies is not a highbrow book at all. It's like a page turner and, you know, whatever. But I found it so instructive to help me think about certain things because I think that what's, What's amazing is that it, it really puts the reader in a position, right, especially the fluent English reader in a position of not knowing what's going on. And when you've had that linguistic authority, right, because like, whatever, the whole world revolves around English practically at this point, right. And so those of us who where English is, you know, a kind of, you know, fluent language, right, we, we, actually, we actually don't have to experience the the challenges that other people often do, right? Communicating, um, uh, communicating. And so actually being thrown into a situation that's from unfamiliar for a lot of us terribly unilingual people like, you know, is, is you know, it's, it's something that we don't experience enough and it requires us to kind of go with the flow right? Not have the control. Um, and I think that those, I think that those are such necessary um, experiences. I think that, you know, there's also, you know, I, I actually also have this thing lately that, and, you know, a lot of this comes from watching people's responses, even to um, the George Floyd's murder and, and other, you know, other. Breonna Taylor. Brianna Taylor and, you know, and, and going back, right, to, I mean, there's Amadou Diallo, right? Like, I mean, there's this history that's just appalling and, you know, but um, that a, a lot of people around me have started like, you know, reading because they want to understand, right? They want to understand, you know, how we got here. And so they're reading how to be an anti-racist or they're reading White Fragility or they're reading all of these books to try and help understand. And I and I've started feeling a lot lately, like the the idea that understanding is a prerequisite to asking to acting is its own kind of delay mechanism, right? I mean, you don't want to. It, yeah, it's a lateral move. Exactly, it's a la that's a great way of putting it, right? It's a lateral move, and so it doesn't actually it doesn't move you forward. It doesn't right, and so you know, and I'm I'm. I'm very much the kind of person that 
you know, I look to someone I trust and they say, this is what we need to be doing. So I'm like, okay, I'm all in and I'll learn along the way. Right. Um, and, uh, and so this idea that one has to understand seems like such a, you know, it's understandable, but it's also kind of selfish, right? Like you, I don't want people to have to wait for me to get up to speed, right? I've had all of these hundreds of years to get up to speed, right? Like our, our country has had all this hundreds of years to get up to speed. And if we haven't now, then we just do what, you know, what people we trust you know, and, you know, are telling us to do or what, what these longstanding um, political movements have been telling us needs to be done. And so, you know, so I, so I, I am, you know, in a way, you know, yeah, I love, I'm curious. I love understanding other people. I love figuring out what makes people tick. Sometimes, you know, if they're terrible people, it's not as much fun, but, you know, Mm -hmm. I, I still, I, I still have that curiosity, but but I, but when I think about what that means from a from a political point of view, it becomes much more difficult to to kind of justify. So I hear I don't, oh, all that you said. I, I'm hearing these uh, almost these crystalline drops of you know check your criteria for understanding with respect to empathy. It may just be another abuse of power. You might be using your English and standard received American English as just another stick to beat somebody with. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, so thank you for that, um, for, for uh, reframing that for me. Um, what I have been learning from the programs and projects in the arts uh, that have taken up so much of my passion as of late in my hometown uh, really does some of it's you know shock and awe about uh, blatant erasure Mm -hmm. some of it is um, disappointment about a lack of the will to inclusion Mm -hmm. Uh, so if I talked about, in, as was mentioned earlier, uh, African-American seamen in the Battle of Lake Erie, for, for Erie, uh, historically and in early Erie, uh, one of the most important things that happened uh, in the Battle of, of in early in the uh, American history uh, happened on Lake Erie. Happened out of Lake Erie, ships were built here and then went out to sea and went up against, you know, the British Navy, uh, the famed British Navy, and ended up in victory setting the northern border of the United States. Um, and that's my, that's my time's almost up. Yeah. <laughs> Peace. And uh, it has been, it's little recognized um, that, what, one in four of the men who fought that battle were African men, of African descent. So when you, and when you look at the artistic renderings, the visual renderings. Total of, you have a very different idea. We are, we have been misinformed, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> so uh, there has been an, an effort as of late since there is a maritime museum. There's mm-hmm. a marker there in which I was involved with the state creating the marker to make, to, to, to bring awareness to that piece. Yeah. But the lack of awareness of that, of knowing that we have been doing what we do together since we, since we were founded, this yeah. is not a simply a community of color from the southern diaspora. Yeah. This is a foundational yeah. exchange. We have been a mosaic society since we were formed hundreds of years ago yeah. and should be measured by hundreds of years of interaction, yeah. not by, you know, post-World War II in that case. But I have found that we are asking uh, in our projects for art to resolve the misremembrance, right? To, to be able to reclaim for our collective mind's eye the image that was true. We were mosaic, we were together, we were united in effort, and we were victorious in that. Yeah. Um, but we didn't, we didn't remember that. We didn't tell ourselves that. We didn't capture that. And we did not ask that of our artists to be, to include that understanding or that vision in what we have commemorated. And so now we have to turn back to artists to say, help us 
remember ourselves aright. You know, it, it's, that's it for me. I'm sorry. I'm out of time. You know, too. I, I, that, that is so fascinating to me because I, you know, I think, I mean, you know, a few years ago, everyone was talking about Hamilton and then every, you know, and then it's, and then it's uh, came up again this summer because of the, you know, film version or, you know, TV version. But one of the things that's so interesting is that, that, in fact, it was such, such a missed opportunity, right? Because it, 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 simply, it simply flipped the binary, right? And turned all of the white figures into black figures with still without recognizing that in fact, there were so many um, black people involved, right? Like there were so, as you're, as you're pointing out, there were actual black people that you could have um, paid attention to and not just, you know, done this sort of, um, flipping of the uh, role reversal, um, it, you know, um, uh, to, to, you know, to, to kind of um, make the point. So, you know, but I, I, I think, that, you know, the other part of it, of course, is that, um, you know, when, when we're asking artists to do this work of, of, of historical, um, restoration restoration right that's a great right um it is that is that you know that there is a way in which um it it always depends on a sort of larger understanding or a larger collective understanding of what the what this sort of revised history should be or what history or even just the idea of what purpose history should serve the other day I was listening to someone who said something so interesting that, you know, you know, there's this term that everyone, you know, kind of hears, right? That history is written by the victors, right? And so then when you, revi when you revise history, right? When you tell these different histories, what you're telling is all of these people who saw themselves as victors, right? <laughs> that, you know, it was their history. We were the ones who won. You're wow. telling them actually that their, that their victory was temporary or that their victory is outdated or their victory was a false victory, right? It was a, it was a fiction of white supremacy as opposed to a, to, to, to some sort of deserved win. And I think that that becomes such an interesting way to think about what the stakes of, um, of filling in the gaps or, mm -hmm. or revising or really rewriting um, some of these narratives that have been passed down and have served ideological purposes beyond some notion of objective what actually happened. And if I may add, um, you know, a third possibility of casting the work as broadening the scope. Yeah. As opposed to, um, uh, totally supplanting any particular uh, contributor. Maybe there's more room there. Yeah, I'm. I. That's a very generous way of looking at it. <laughs> I'm. I'm like. I'm like. Knock all the statues down. <laughs> knock them all down. <laughs> Rhonda. Rhonda Matthews. Rhonda, I don't see you. Oh, okay. I was trying to get unmuted. Okay, <laughs> Rhonda. I um, want to talk about empathy. Yeah. I want to talk about empathy um, because this summer as, as uh, we were reading uh, Whitewalling, that is the thing that resonated with me the most. Um, so I want to talk about empathy in the political sphere. So, um, so here's the, here's the foundation from which I leap. Um, I d could give a uh, about empathy in the, <laughs> in the political sphere. I really, I think it has no place um, in the political sphere. If we're talking about large scale social movements, if we're talking about uh, increased representation, you know, especially if we're talking about in art, both in art that's in the museum or, or in the art that we make that we call pop culture, um, um, no matter where it is, I feel like this discussion of empathy is misplaced. So, so can you talk a little bit more about that and um, specifically as it related to um, um, Schutz's work? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, um, 
you know, I agree with everything that you just said. Um, you know, I think that, I think that there's, I, I think that the problem with, with the idea that empathy is, is a, a kind of means to transformation is it puts all the, it puts, it, it places the prerequisite on all of us changing our hearts and minds, right? And then having the collective will to change policy or laws or um, structures or whatever. And, you know, the, 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 the problem of course is, and I think that um, Kendi really makes the case for this very well, is that if every structure in your society is, is designed in order to make clear that some people are less fully human than others, right? I mean, like that the U.S. is, every institution in the U.S. is designed according to that principle, right? That there, there is a certain class or caste um, of people who are less fully entitled to be understood as human than others, right? So if you've got every, every institution built to communicate that, then where is the space for even the most well-intentioned person who is not of that group? Where is the imaginative space to be able to say, right? No, every part of this is wrong. And that's why so many of us have trouble understand, being able to recognize the ways in which the institutions that we might know are in the most intimate ways, right? From our prof professional experience or our, um, you know, our experience with our churches, our experiences with our schools, whatever it is, right? That it's so hard for us to see the ways in which they function in a structurally racist way, precisely because there's no way of stepping out of it, right? And so, you know, and so there is where, you know, I'm much, I, I, I sort of feel like, you know, I, I, and, you know, and this all becomes harder, right? When I talk, when I say, okay, when a person I trust tells me that this institution has to change in these ways, I will say, okay, and then I'll figure out like what the logic is afterwards, right? Like I'll do that on my own time. And, and, but part of it is that my world is much less segregated mm -hmm. now than it was even 10 or 15 years ago, right? So like I've actually done the work of desegregating my intellectual and my social and my personal lives and whatever. I've done that work. So then I know, um, you know, and I know lots of people and I know who I trust to say like, this is the work that needs to happen. And so I think like there's two parts of it, right? Like none of this happens without some level of personal commitment or transformation, but it's not, it's not like, oh, first I have to be convinced. Like who the hell am I? Why should I need to be convinced, right? Like, I'm just, like, you know, it can't start from there, right? And so that's what I find, you know, really important. See, and I, I like that. Um, I like that point of view because what it does is it, it, it says that you don't really have to feel anything in order to be about the business of making change, right? You don't, you don't need to feel bad um, about a discriminatory law before you change it. Yep. You can just change it. Yeah. <laughs> You never have to be and so I feel I feel that way about the ways in which we talk about art and the ways in which we talk about inclusion. Um Dr. I'm gonna out Dr. Wellman. Um she and I have been talking about when when uh, Beyonce's lemonade came out. Oh when okay, she I and hear I that. have been talking about actually, you know, doing something like this. We just never got a chance to do it, you know, think busy and all of that stuff. But but one of the things that we talked about was the ways in which she represented um, what the ways in which she represented uh, black women um, and uh, and around that black culture. Yeah. And so and and there was and there was no call for empathy in that. There was there was none of this kind of playing to um, people's people's um, quote unquote empathetic feelings. She just placed fact 
right? And the experience, the, the experience, the fact of her experience and the experience of a lot of Black women, mm-hmm. right, onto the screen. She presented it us, it she presented it to us as art. Mm-hmm. And I think when you talk about empathy um, and the ways in which it's misused uh, mm-hmm. in the service of change, mm-hmm. that that we see that in um, in art, and we particularly see it in the ways in that um, that. I'm trying to figure out how to put this delicately. W- ways in which um, um, Please don't be uneducated <laughs> white artists present these images in, um, in their work, right? Because it, it's, it's almost never about the experience of fact. It is about empathy, which... You know, this is, this is what I... Th- you know, it, it's so... Um, interesting what you're saying because I think like what I what I consistently um, hear from you know museum professionals especially right is like people will come and they'll say especially lately like you know we have these objects in our collection we know that they're that there's a lot of problems around race with this historical object right so what do we do right and how do we contextualize it, right? And so my question always is like, okay, if you imagine that your audience, like, you know, and they say like, it's important that we show it because we don't want to erase this history of, you know, of racial injustice in the US, right? We don't want to just hide it, right? Mm -hmm. So my answer is always, well, what if you imagine your audience is black, right? Is it important then for them to see the history of racism when they have to live through the present of racism, right? Like, I mean, in some cases, it may be. In some cases, it may be important for, you know, for for us to say, okay, this unearths something about the past that 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 is is really important for for our black audience to know, say, right? So fine, then contextualize it. But like that, if you start with the idea that your audience is black and a good part of your audience may be black, what happens to the way that you then start thinking about these problems, right? Like is that what you wanna show to your black audience, right? And and if it is fine, then then do the work and make it available. But if if it's not, if it's just gratuitous, then whatever stick it in a storage cupboard and like show something else that might be more useful or interesting or valuable or inspirational or whatever it is right well one of the things that we talked about uh, this summer is, is we were reading the book and i <laughs> i had this conversation that i was the only non-artist uh, sitting there but we were talking about this very thing and i and I was saying um, that, you know, if if I win the, the Powerball, right, one of the, there's going to, one of the funds <laughs> to, that I'm going to dedicate my money to is so that whenever I go into a place and there is a mammy or a Sambo figure, I'm going to buy it and destroy it. Like, it'll be my life's mission, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to destroy those things because of the, because of the damage that they do, you know, and, and it's hard, I think, for people to hear that because yeah. of the, the idea of history, et cetera. But my, my response is always, well, who's history? Yeah. Well, I think that, I think it's who's history. And I think the other part of it is that, you know, all of these things get so complicated because of course, like your black audience, you know, a black audience isn't a monolith either, right? Like there's lots of different, I was just thinking as you were talking about this, that, you know, Kara Walker collects those figures, right? And so like, you know what I mean? So it's not even like there's sort of one template that you sort of can apply to it, but certainly it, it certainly we're so i mean certainly in, in the museum world i think especially we're so um people curators they think about the audience the audience right as this undifferentiated mass and whenever you think of an audience as any group as undifferentiated almost always people are conceptualizing it as white right as as the race that's n- that's never actually marked or named right like whiteness is like the the forever you know kind of unmarked category right and so and so 
you know, but even those sorts of moments where you're actually sort of flipping the expectations, I think, and, and, and actually for, for many, because museum, you know, decision-making museum staff in this country, people at higher levels is, you know, I mean, appallingly white, right? It's 85% or something like that. So um, even as you're, you know, so, so this is actually like work that people have to do, conscious work of like saying, okay, what happens if I, if I do that? Now, is the project, you know, is it enough to rely on an individual white curator's empathy in order to imagine what it, how a, a Black audience might respond to it? No. And that's where actually bringing, that's where representation comes in, right? That's where bringing in, actually hiring Black people, actually like bringing in, um, uh, you know, people um, uh, to, 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 to talk through these things becomes really crucial, right? So, so again, like this, this idea that, you know, even if you're going to sort of say, okay, let's flip the script here a little bit, it still requires something beyond empathy, right? To, to be able to, you know, to, to be able to make good decisions, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. That was my 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Leslie, please. Okay. Um, so a lot of the things that came to mind as you were sharing, um, Aruna, is one of the first things was, of course, my connection with Anzal Dua's work, right? And this idea of language um, being a place of empowerment of agency right so as a chicana um writer and activist theorist she she did this in the 80s right and black feminism um you know has paved that way before her um where these the vernacular and the languages and that mixture being embedded in the writing as as a form of embodying empowerment and agency right mm -hmm. through one's identities um but i think that the other thing that that you touched on is also how that trauma and re-traumatizing -tra even through the writing and the words and the telling and the narrating is also very much a part of the re remembering right so as artists as curators as educators we are going in between these spaces where it's 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 work it's trauma that comes out that is ours that has been on our backs for generations yeah. through our roots through our history and our heritage those things that have been lost and those things that that we dig back up for ourselves, right? So I think that that is um, a very valid, real part of this conversation, how the languages component and the mistranslation or the intentional um, unknowing of these languages, right? Um, you know, I, I think about my own heritage and my own roots with um, Lebanon and the Caribbean and Spain and what what are the parts of those heritage that have been successfully dominant yeah. throughout my experience and which parts am I going back now and trying to reclaim for myself through language sure right sure. um but then and so and the other part of that I think is that active listening and collaborative component that is so crucial. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that came from our critical conversations that we started with whitewalling in the spring was how do, as artists of color, do we come together and create um, art that reclaims pieces of ourselves for ourselves, right? Acknowledging that we're in these institutions that are not made for us. They're not made by us. Yeah. But how do we inhabit them, even if it's temp temporarily for ourselves, by ourselves, and that embodiment through our work? So I, you know, this is so interesting because I've been thinking about this, the last piece that you were talking about a lot. Um, and I was thinking about um, Simone Lee's work 
Um, and uh, the way, you know, her work, I mean, it's, you know, she makes these large scale, um, well, not all large scale, but often mental um, jurors, ceramics, um, but she also has a very strong social practice component um, that runs through her work. But one of the things that her work is premised on is the idea of, um, of that, that everything shouldn't be available to view. So she's very inspired by um, groups of Black women activists, for example, who worked in complete secret to provide health care to communities. Or she's interested in the ways in which, um, you know, female prisoners would, would um, form kind of zones of protection for uh, Black women in prison so they could be able to give birth and, and protect their children before their children were taken away. Or she's interested in all of these ways in which the work happened away from the spectacle of the white gaze, right? Away from all of that. And she creates these sculptures. And, and if you notice her sculptures, right? They, they're, they, um, they have no eyes, right? Her sculptures never have eyes. And it's a kind of uh, not looking that allow, that it doesn't allow you to claim them either, right? You, they're, there's, they're very haunting, I think, in the way in which you know that, there, that there's some secretiveness, there's some inside that you can't access, right? And I, and I think that that's an amazing, and, and her other social practice work also um, kind of, um, uh, draws upon that, uh, you know, she's, you know, when she won the Guggenheim, the Hugo Boss Award at the Guggenheim, she, um, part of her project was uh, organizing a symposium, a very important symposium that uh, exclusively all of the speakers were Black women, right? There was not a single non-Black, non-woman kind of in, in this lineup. And I think that there is a way in which, you know, she's always said quite openly, my, I'm making my work for Black women, right? That's who I'm making my work for. And, and everyone else is, is, is welcome to experience it. And I will give you whatever tools you think you need to help you understand it. But you are not my audience. My audience are the people who understand what I mean when I say that I'm sharpening my oyster knife or whatever it is, right? Like you're like that's that's my audience, and I think that that um, I, I find that that I find that position so bracing, right? Because it's saying, like you know, she it's saying that she doesn't have to she doesn't have to be translatable into the language of whiteness in order for her work, A, to be beautiful to look at and interesting to engage with, but B, to deserve to be in the place that she's in, right? So she doesn't, she, she doesn't have to translate herself in order to make, in order to, to occupy those spaces, right? And I find that such a powerful position. And I, and I think that that's like, you know, and especially for me, right? Like I'm a non-Black person of color. I'm a person who is, you know, who's, I'm South Asian originally. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm of a minority that is often framed as a model minority, which is a you know, this to me suggests a kind of uh, history of adapting oneself to the structures of whiteness, right? In order to in order to succeed, and so to me, the idea of saying no, like instead, like instead of address, you know, adapting oneself or translating myself into the structures of whiteness, what might it look like? if I lived in an untranslated way, right, in a certain sense, like, I mean, I find that so bracing, like, what would that look like, right? Like, I'm not sure that I know, but I want to find out, right? So, yeah. Yeah, it's an, op I see it as an opportunity, and mm -hmm. as, um, as a place where it's living in that in between, but as a place of privilege, because of that, yeah, because of that straddling, because yeah. of that not being not having to conform into yeah. a certain 
and I, yeah. And I also think, I mean, you know, we, you know, there's also a way in which, I mean, and this is something that I think um, has been talked about by so many uh, Chicana and, and Latina scholars, right? Uh, uh, you know, and 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 other scholars as well. But I mean, the idea that that the borderlands or these spaces of hybridity, um, these spaces of mixing um, are somehow, um, I can kind of, like to me, those are, those are these spaces, right? Like you have to, you know, that, that it, it feels to me like in order to survive this world that we have made for ourselves for better or for worse, one has to be able to function in those kinds of spaces, right? One has to be able, well, let's say, let's say not function, but one has to be able to survive even those kinds of spaces, right? And especially when we are living in a time where governments are making those spaces harder and harder to survive in, right? But those are the spaces that characterize what it means to, to, to be able to move on, to, to, to function, to move on. And I think that, and, and, and I think that, you know, in, in an ideal world, they wouldn't be hard places, right? Like in a just world, they wouldn't be hard, hard places to survive. They would be spaces in which we 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 recognize the necessity right we recognize the necessity of the of the mixing of the multilingual nature of the pidgin languages of the of of the refugee right like that 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 is the human condition right like that that is what the human condition is even as our governments try and make that condition less human right that they try and dehumanize those conditions, right? But that is the human condition. And so, yeah, so I, I, I think that like, it's so, I, I think that for me thinking about the ways in which, it, you know, and that's why thinking about art that's coming up around these sort of border crises and refugee crises is so interesting because I think that this is where, um, you know, this is, these the borders are sites of dehumanization, right? Um, just as the slave ship was a site of dehumanization, right? Borders are, or the plantation was a site. Borders are the site of dehumanization too. And so thinking about all those spaces, right? In terms of these, um, and thinking about the ways in which they're actually spaces that are teaching us about what it is to be human rather than, spaces in which humanity is is depleted from us like i mean you know uh, you know i i don't i'm not meaning to romanticize them i'm just saying like what if we what if we recognize that you know that that that's that those skills of survival are actually you know what might lead us to survive now um to, and to re rebuild with new imaginations exactly. right which that's is one I of think. the things that that I, I that I took away from your yeah. talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's with great reluctance <laughs> that I will tell you all that it was a few minutes after the hour of seven. And so um, I would love to invite us to stay on a few minutes after our host uh, ceases to um, record this just for a few moments of informal leave taking, but I would like to end by thanking everybody, thanking all of our participants. And I do have one final news flash, um, and that is to invite anyone and everyone to join the virtual version of Sculpture X, the 2020 symposium. The topic is art and agency, and it will be held Wednesday through Saturday, September 16 through 19. It's free. It's open to the public. Uh, the registration is limited to 500, um, and anyone interested can go to sculpturex.org website to look at the different panelists, which will include some of the people who were present here, um, and uh, to register. Thank you. Thank you all. That was a really um, lovely conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you.
And congratulations again on the new position. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, thanks for uh, hanging on to that, that thought. <laughs> uh, I did have one more thing I wanted to ask you, and that is given the, the latest Whitney cancellation of a show due to objections, um, can you draw any lines of similarities between that and the biennial and any lessons learned? That would be, that would be great if we, <laughs> if, if we I could. That, I think that, you know, one of the problems that we're in now and the Whitney maybe particularly since it's been so um, protested um, in recent years mm -hmm. is that there's that there is actually no appetite for controversy. And so I kept wondering, so, you know, so the, the, the Whitney made a silly move, right? By, um, you know, buying up these uh, artists prints from uh, mutual aid auctions and, you know, so buying these things that were meant to sort of be artist to artist sales that would help, you know, artists in need, right? Because of the pandemic buying up these prints for cheap and then deciding to put them in an exhibition and only actually telling the artists after the fact, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, you know, telling the artists, oh, we've bought your prints and we're putting them in an exhibition. And so a lot of uh, artists and most of these artists were um, young uh, black artists, um, but, uh, but anyway, so, um, so going through that and, 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 you know, so there was a series of like really sort of poor decisions. Right. But when the, when the objections were made and, you know, a lot of the objection was, you know, I, I made this available for very cheap for this mutual aid project, but, you know, I've now like, this is the work that you're, acquiring into the museum's collection and it's not even really going into the museum's collection it's going into the museum's archive and no one told me about it before and blah 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 so instead of actually doing the work of repair of saying reaching out to the individual artists and saying hey we're sorry what can we do to make this right and is there anything that we can do to make you feel okay putting on this exhibition, um, they just canceled the show, right? And so that is the part that I think is really problematic, right? Like, you know, like, I mean, frankly, like museum archives do this all the time, right? They buy um, these sorts of things as uh, historical documents, right? But like the idea that you're gonna, that you're gonna propose a show and then someone's gonna, people are gonna, quite legitimately object but then instead of trying to make it right you're just going to cancel the show that seems to me where the lesson is not learned right like that seems to me where like the the museum is like functioning in terms of damage control instead of community engagement and that's problematic to me so yeah wait i can't hear anyone I was trying not to over. <laughs> I'm holding. I'm holding it back. So. Anyone so, else? Uh, yeah, that that oh. seems like uh, what they call a strong but not tough response. That's yeah. not resilient, and that's not. Um, and it, uh, it it works against engagement. Totally and growth. And um, but I, I was interested to see if you could see. Um, well, I think that, I think that there's, I mean, I think that there in general, you know, the problem with, you know, museums love to talk about themselves as platforms for conversations, like places where you have difficult conversations, but it's really hard to converse with a museum, right? Like, I mean, like, you know, it's, it's sort of like they're, they become like this sort of boxing ring and they put different people in the ring and let them duke it out. But like, you can never actually talk to a museum because they don't make that space available. And it feels like, so to me, that's the through line, right? Is that, is that, you know, you know, whenever controversy arises, a museum will say, well, you know, we welcome these difficult conversations, but it's like, well, actually a conversation requires you to listen and actually respond, right? It doesn't just require us to sort of 
speak and speak and speak and hit a blank wall. So well, also the, the, the Whitney has, I mean, this is part of their history. They've done this before. They didn't even learn from what they did in the past. And that's the part that is um, the worst about this, I think, that, you know, you you had the tools to do this correctly and you chose not to. You chose to follow the same negative path that you did before that brought you criticism, legitimate criticism before. Yeah. So I, you know, I find that deeply disappointing. I mean, it just means that they haven't learned anything. Well, I think that, you know, that's, I mean, in a way that's sort of when I talk about the, um, when I talk about these museums, like, you know, I sort of, you know, in a way they're designed not to learn, right? Like, I mean, they're designed to hold up to, to kind of, um, protect whiteness and they're designed to exclude non-whiteness and so it's really it's really hard to overcome those structures right um and you know despite the you know even you know despite the fact that they might have i mean the whitney staff is like you know in certain departments is a very politically aware and activist staff right like you know certainly in the education department and you know in different um, elements of the museum, but they're working within structures. And, you know, it, this is where even like MoMA and the Whitney have been buying up this stuff for decades and they've been putting on exhibitions for decades. Right. But it, but now they're doing it and no one's objected, right? Like no one's objected when their work has been included in an, in a, archive exhibition. But now they're, they're trying to justify that, or they're trying to operate according to that system, when they're now dealing with a whole, you know, because of this drive towards inclusiveness, working with a whole other sort of community and generation of artists, right? And so in, instead of saying, okay, so maybe our, our systems should change, right? They're just surprised when people aren't just going with the flow the way they have in the past, right? But, you know, the, these are young artists who are, you know, the, 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 the museum paid whatever it was, $100 for each of their work or whatever it was. Um, and these are artists who have been, you know, for the most part, really struggling through this terrible moment in which the, you know, in which these museums with major endowments haven't done pretty much anything to support the lives of artists, right? Like, you know, and so, and so, you know, yeah, it's a different context. It's a different group of people. It's people who have some sense of their own power um, and their own empowerment. And, you know, and so, yeah, what worked in the past doesn't work anymore. And it's just a matter of like, you know, figuring, you know, trying to figure out when that light bulb is going to go off um, and things will change. I mean, that said, maybe these are the protests that sort of show that the light bulb needs to go off. Right. I mean, you know, that, that, you know, but who knows. Right. But it is, it is frustrating. It's like this recursiveness. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I look forward to um, a non-binary response, you know, uh, something other than draw, you know, drawing back uh, yeah. when totally. the unexpected happens. So in this case, this might be the first time I'm going to say, hey, let's imagine a non-binary, you know, option, solution. I, you know, I think that's, I think that's absolutely, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that, you know, it'll, you know, the, 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 the problem is that, you know, a lot of museums are operating according to a, a sort of um, corporate um, harm mitigation or whatever you call it, um, sort of cover your ass uh, kind of model. Risk, well, risk aversion. Yeah, risk aversion. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, kind of model. And I think that that, um, I think that that has grown uh stronger and stronger in recent years and it's less and less able to deal with the the very 
real and very painful controversies that are coming up around this. Um, you know, I also think that, you know, that the, one of the things that's so interesting to me is the way in which, right, in the late 60s, early 70s, that activists, Black activists, were so smart about the ways in which they were identifying the structural problems, right, and, and, and demanding that of museums. Um, so it wasn't a responsive kind of thing, right? They were actually like, you know, they were, they were, in a sense, you know, they were, they were protesting for things um, and um, not protesting against things um, or not just protesting against things. And I think that, I think that that um, more and more seems to be the model that, that, you know, certainly there are certain like large scale activist groups fight for 15 and, and um, the in defense of black lives that are, are adopting that or, or, or have always been doing that kind of work. But I think that as that filters, as that model filters more and more into the space of art protest, that that will be a really important um, shift. And I think, I think we've started to see that um, starting in June or so uh, with uh, especially museum employees, um, you know, kind of um, making very legitimate demands of their employers um, to change. You know, I, I, these large museums like the Whitney are, they're bureaucracies and the, the primary purpose of a bureaucracy is to maintain its existence, right? To make everything so convoluted, all of its functions and processes so convoluted that you can never cut through it or make major change without, you know, the maximum possible effort. And I feel like that's what the Whitney is. It's just, it's just another bureaucracy. Even on a smaller scale, I think museums um, um, begin, especially those that are doing well in their communities, even if they are smaller than the Whitney, uh, are just, they're, they're operating as bureaucracies. And so that makes it that much tougher. There's, there's absolutely that. And, and certainly like as museums have, I mean, the transformation in museums in the 1990s was massive, right? They turned into these very neoliberal kinds of institutions and, you know, the, you know, the, their budgets exploded, their, you know, their endowments exploded, right? The, the idea of what you needed to run a museum, you know, kind of exploded, right? It was the blockbuster, you know, everything has to be a blockbuster for the large museums. But there's this other thing that, you know, these are institutions that a lot of them, their whole purpose is to preserve the past, right? <laughs> and, so, and so it's really hard to get a bunch of people who, 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 who are trained to set so much value in the past to start of, to, to sort of uh, change the future. Right. And so, and so there's that, there is also like, I think, you know, I think the museums that manage to be truly activist and transformative institutions, I mean, more power to them because they're bucking against, like a you know the in a sense their own conceptual kind of premise right like you know so i i think that's part of it as well but yeah so thank you all yes thank you aruna thank you we look, we look forward to continuing this conversation excellent okay good night everybody good night